I know. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like we're live. If, okay. if all the uh, technology gods have treat That's are treating great. us well, welcome uh, Andrea McHugh to the ROI you. in You podcast. I'm Thank super you. excited because I actually spoke with a with a potential student this morning who was talking about how she loves to travel and how, whether or not what the career opportunities are in travel and tourism and. Um, there are there were more than there are now. Yes, but I'm hoping that you can uh, give us some some insight on where things are at now, and then also where you think things are headed. But first, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, sure. So I'll start off with the travel piece and work my way backwards. Um, my most recent role was for the past almost a decade. Um, I served as the um, senior communications manager for Discover Newport, which is a destination management organization, which is also more colloquially known as like a tourism bureau. And um, the organization of tourism bureaus are different across the U.S. Some are um, nonprofit organizations, some are funded by the city or state, some are quasi. So the back end of it might be different, but they all serve the same purpose, which is really to elevate the destination in terms of visibility and to get as many, uh, to use an industry term, heads and beds. Um, that is what um, tours and bureaus want. They want people come to their destination and day travelers, um, but typically it is the lodging component that really helps um, fund an organization to do more outreach. And that includes two sectors. It's the um, leisure market, which is when you go on vacation. And um, the sales component is usually garnering conventions and meetings to your destination. So um, my role there was as the chief media liaison. So I was working with any kind of media that was covering the destination. And that is a really um, wide spectrum that goes from um, scouts for TV and film that are looking for places to shoot to your traditional um, magazines, your travel and leisure, your Condé Nast, um, to really B2B publications, um, websites and bloggers and influencers. So it's a big spectrum. Um, but before that, um, that I was on the other end of that, that was on the media side of it. So I think one of the things that helped me as a media liaison was that I knew what it was like to be in the media and what you need to succeed with um, a story. And typically that's having the right assets, having images, having B-roll, having press releases that have meat to them and substance, you know, functionally making their jobs easier. So being on the other end of that um, in journalism, um, was able to kind of just proffer different subjects. I was able to see what might be a good story um, to get coverage in these publications so that we could get more visibility. Um, and most of my background before that was all in some sort of media space. I've also been a media buyer. Um, when I was young in my career, I worked for Time Life, which merged, this is gonna make me sound like a dinosaur, but um, it was when Time Life merged with AOL, which was really oh, wow. the big, the big media partnership of the early 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was an exciting time. Um, and um, that was media buying is when you're buying commercial space on networks. And that was really the first time I had worked with Providence. I had never been to Providence. I had never been to Rhode Island. Um, and that gave me some market familiarity. So I think what I'm leading to is that even though your resume might um, appear to be in different spaces, oftentimes if you take a little step back, you'll see everything falls under the same umbrella. It's just different, wearing different hats under the same role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, and you, you also have your own personal blog. Are you still blogging? I am still blogging. Um, that was launched purely out of a fun hobby. I was at a lifestyle magazine and I'm going back, um, well, it was you know before my last role, so maybe about 12 years ago. That's my guess, um, yeah around there and um, the only so much makes the cut into a product spread or into you know a story that maybe doesn't have legs to develop into something bigger and I was like god there, you know this town which I'm totally a carpet bagger um, I've only been in Newport since um, 2002 but I just thought there were so many stories to be told um, so that was really my purpose and it was my drive and so whether it was uh, a small business doing something really cool and innovative or a designer that um, chose Newport to call home or um, just different even everything in the food and dining space it was something that I could cover stories that I thought were interesting with no one to answer to and just throw it out there in the net so I'm still doing it it's still fun um, it's funny with blogging oftentimes there's a lot of talk about strategy and 
all these things. I just do it. I just do it because I like it. I, you know, I wasn't looking to get a uh, huge ad advertising dollars or sponsors. And I had tons of people tell me what I should do with it. Um, <laughs> it's like, I also need to sleep. So yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's not sweet. Plus it, there's something about turning your, turning your, this is another thing that I spoke with this um, potential student who's graduating um, from college and, you know, sort of looking to get the next, get a jump on the career, you know, get her career jump started. And she actually is interesting because ROI and you, we are, we're currently um, targeting journalism, marketing, English majors, communications majors, and she is a sociology and anthropology major. And, wow. uh, you know, and I just think like that, you know, there's so much of a behavioral science that goes into digital marketing. I should probably rethink how we're, how we're doing this. But anyway, one of the things we were talking about is, um, turning your hobby into your work and mm. this whole concept of do what you love and do what you love. And uh, do you have a different opinion on that? The do what you love piece? It's funny you say that because I took a look at my resume before we were going to chat today and I've always been programmed to do what I love and work in places that I thought would excite me. And often that means not taking the highest offer. Um, you know, I didn't want to be an accountant and accountants are essential. Um, or I went to a big a school. Um, I went to Loyola university and they had a pretty big business program. And, um, let me tell you, a lot of the people walking out of school walked into really nice salaries. And mm -hmm. I certainly have people um, that were in the humanities and in the journalism and uh, literary arts with me. And we look and like still making maybe triple. Um, but I also know the slog of, I'm originally from the New York area. Um, and I know a lot of the friends that, you know, take either the bus in or the subway in and they're leaving their house at 5.30 and they're getting home at 9.30. And, you know, you have to step back and see what the lifestyle fit is best for you. Like that might excite you, you know, hitting, right. you know, crazy amount of money is, might be your driver. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. For me, it was about chasing things I really loved. Right. And that, that was my, and not being afraid, um, not being afraid to, um, you know, put yourself out there and not be afraid to do the hard work. Um, I lived in California for a short time and I was young. It was like right after college. Um, and one of the things I did was work for a production company. Um, and we did uh, a lot of the event management and catering for um, concerts and photo shoots and magazine shoots. And it's, it, it helped me learn the business and working with the PR people and, you know, craft services and the set and all this stuff. And someone might look at a resume and not see the connection between the two but you're accruing the skills and it excited. We're going in a different location every day and um, doing the hard work though. And, and that's just always going to, to me, layer onto your experience on your resume. Yeah. And I think uh, one, one thing I was thinking, because you, your blog predates your work at Discover Newport. And I think yes. that that must've made you such a shoe in for that role because you're already doing the work. Basically, you just kind of weren't getting right. paid for it. <laughs> in that, you know, in an expanded capacity. That was, that was completely how it happened. And I was writing. Um, and then I started, I started the blog. They had noticed the blog. Then I started kind of as a contractor was doing some blogging for them. Now going back 10, 10 years, you know, that was really innovative to have a blog. And, you know, before the talk about SEO and having fresh content and how it contributes to your website's reach, and then I started writing their travel guides, um, again, as a contractor, because I knew the destination inside and out. Um, and then when a position became open that really enveloped all those skills, um, I was really excited to apply for it and get it. Yeah. So it all, no, I the, think it's fantastic. I, I always say everything leads, you never know what door is going to be open. And that might be at a networking event, and that might be, you know, at a um, industry cocktail hour, you know, you really don't know where the opportunities lie. So you have to sink your teeth right into it. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I just, uh, talking about what, what you said previously about building skills. I'm just looking at the tip that you gave us for the tip card and it's learn skills outside your silo. You spent years studying your field, but in the workplace, you'll be wearing more than one hat. 
being prepared not only makes managing your load easier, but makes you more marketable. And um, I think your experience of, of understanding, you know, when you're working with media, because I've, I've been to numerous of the events that you would host through Discover Newport, the marketing meetings. And it was interesting talking to people about, oh, um, I'm working with this magazine and they're looking for this idea or they want, they want a theme around this. And it's just fascinating how, how close that relationship is between the media and the, um, and the tourism bureau, because um, yeah, it's just, I think it's really incredible. And I think you must have brought great assets knowing, okay, these are the components that they need. This is really what they're looking for because I've, I've had to do that myself. It, absolutely. If you've kind of walked the walk, you can help other people when they're looking for that. And you might see for the pitching side of it, you might see a publication that is going to be, um, you know, a lot of times you see, okay, big thing in the media right now, of course, is list. When you get on top five destinations to visit this winter, top romantic getaways from New York City, you know, and, all, and that is all the work um, that someone like me does. Um, you pitch magazines and say, oh, hey, you know, this is of course back in the before times, but, um, you know, you think of Newport, of course, as a summertime playground, but have you ever considered that in the heart of winter, we have a winter festival and we have drink contests and we have igloos and we have frozen bars and, uh, you know, you work with enough writers like, oh, that's super cool. Like, I love that idea. And it's kind of repurposing uh, maybe what someone's idea of a place is. And just having a good knowledge of that is, is, is really helpful. Um, I went to a conference and there was a trio of writers on the panel and, um, one of them talked, what, her big thing was the intersection of um, African-American culture and food. She did a lot in all the top magazines mm -hmm. for um, where those two places intersect. And I was never, I was, Newport gets a lot of, you know, media relationships that I wasn't doing a, a huge portion of my business wasn't cold pitching. Like, I don't know who this writer is, or I don't know who this editor is. I'm just going to throw spaghetti at the wall. It was much more strategic than that. But I kind of stepped out of my comfort zone. And after they had like a, you know, a little gathering afterwards after the panel. And I went up to her and was like, um, you know, I'm from Newport, Rhode Island. And um, it was the rum capital of the world at one point. And um, sadly was part of the triangle trade. And, um, you know, but today you're, we're seeing, you know, emerging breweries and the, the first, you know, um, distillery open since prohibition. And she, she was like, what are you talking about? Like she had never heard of that. And to a lot of people in um, the Northeast, they know about that history, but yeah. you know, she was born and raised in a different part of the country and it just wasn't top of mind. And I was so excited to work with her and you know uncover some of the stories that Newport had in that space. And as mm -hmm. you know, presenting a destination in a whole different way. Um, it wasn't right. about going out on boats and the mansions, which definitely have their place. Um, yeah. But it was just seeing where her work and, you know, the top magazines in the country and our history could intersect and help tell our story right. in, a, in a really cool way. Another thing I did was, um, I think it was like the second year I worked there, um, I worked with the New York Times writer. And of course, anyone in my position gets, you know, really excited. The New York Times is interested. Yeah, of course. And she was awesome, though. She's like, I don't want to tell the mansion story. And I don't want to tell the big yacht story. What else you got? Right. And she did. It was for the um, 36 hours in, in the travel section of the Times. Mm -hmm. And she kind of did, you know, the Newport you don't know. And she covered our art scene and hole in the wall pubs and just creative things happening. Mm -hmm. Like the Newport that you didn't know from the glossy magazines and yeah. created it in such a different way that was, you know, really exciting. So it's always kind of rethinking things uh, in a new and creative way. Yeah. Well, I think that that brings up something that I find is maybe not discussed enough um, is, is the creativity of, of work, right? And what's required, I think, in, in marketing and in media is um, thinking outside the box. And you just gave some great examples, but how important that is and, and thinking on your feet also. Yes. It's a big part of it. Um, you know, we... Early on, I had an ex exciting opportunity to work with Good Morning America. And again, that's another like 
total brass ring. You know, morning morning show coverage is just really sets the bar. And it required fitting in a lot into a, I think we had a day or so to shoot it. And then um, it was a uh, folk fest weekend, which is when you have like an extra 15,000 people in town. Um, it takes 10 and- times longer to do anything. You, you're better off on a bike <laughs> or walking <laughs> and- than a car. That's, and that's the know-how that um, when I was working with the producer on paper, it was going to be easy to get from sunset to Castle Hill to an America's Cup boat to do a sunset sailing shot. And yeah. of course, this is when Folk Fest is going to be wrapping up. And I was like, there's going to be 10,000 people exiting yeah. Fort Adams at the same time. Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, we just had, a, you know, just working around that, uh, those parameters and having intimate knowledge of a place is, is really helpful. And um, we, we got the shop, you know, you want it to be perfect. So that what we did was the next morning, we had to stick myself in a little white uniform and I had to raise the sails on a yacht and get a chase boat so that the, the cameraman could get the shot of the boat tilting ever so perfectly in the sun. And um <laughs> Times you gotta roll up your sleeve. A lot of times you have to roll up your sleeves and just make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I think that's really. There's so much in life that in, in in careers that's like that. I mean, it might not be getting on America's Cup yacht to hoist a sail, but uh, that's it's. Think of that as a metaphor, I guess. It, you know, it, there's a point. You have to be able to roll with the flow a lot, and um, in that tip about learning skills outside your silo, it's, you know, I think it's really important. That kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that everything amounts to experience. And, um, you know, if you work at a smaller company, um, you may not have the breadth of talent to be able to, everyone stays in their little workstation to make something happen. And you might have to wear multiple hats. So, you know, for example, um, you, I am always been more attracted to writing and literature and history and numbers are not my strength. Um, <laughs> my accounting example earlier, um, but you might have to help a production crew with what a budget looks like. Um, when you're going to conferences, you're going to have to reconcile all of your charges. Um, when you um, start your own business, you have to have a little bit of a working knowledge of how does the taxes work? How does filing work? How does budgeting for equipment work? All those things. Um, and I worked at a startup, um, a startup news site um, a while ago. And um, yeah, I look back and I sometimes you look back and say, what could I have done to learn more? And there was a, a whole video component and technology that like, I figured that that is, that's, that's what they do in that side of the office. And I wish that I got behind the camera and learned a little bit more. Um, so that I could have that skill set. Um, the first job offer I had at a college when I was pursuing broadcast journalism was in a tiny market, like everyone does, starts off in a tiny market. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the good news, you know, was that you're doing what you want to do. But in a tiny market, they also hand you a camera and a tripod and you have to shoot and edit and record all of your own <laughs> packages. And um, in the end, it was a big move and for the lifestyle choice, I, I decided that I wasn't gonna take that opportunity, but that would have been one of those things that in journalism, in my day, they weren't teaching you how to operate and edit a camera. I mean, I was in, I had interned for the station, a different station back in Baltimore. And thankfully I had a bit of that skill. So one of my things, I know it's a very obvious thing, but intern, 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 because it's, it's gonna help you forge relationships. It's gonna put you in places maybe you didn't expect in that internship did expose me to was you know I had a really great news director and they were had a great intern program so I was cutting tape and I was editing my packages and I was doing the voice recordings and um just like you know the packages came out on the reel just like I was reporting the news and you know that technical side isn't learned in the classroom often so if you have a chance to learn something new that seems completely unrelated to what you're doing um jump in with both feet yeah, why not? I think uh, I think it's really important to to do that. That's one thing, you know. Looking back, um, I knew that I did not want to do broadcast, and because a it was very competitive, and b I didn't feel like I had enough camera presence. But I do wish that I had just gone to learn the lessons. Right? I'm sure that there are things now that would be helpful to know. 
um, you know, in doing this type of setup, some, um, some tips and things like that. So I'm just wondering, you know, if, if anyone is um, thinking about, oh, wow, I'd really like to, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be better on camera. What, are there certain skills that you would, or soft skills that you would recommend? Well, like you said earlier, you really have to be able to think on your feet and that's taking advantage of every opportunity you have, whether it's, especially nowadays with podcasts, if you can be a guest on a podcast, if um, record yourself to see what your strengths are and what you can work on. Um, people, everyone has our isms. Uh, I, I love the um, President Biden's press secretary. I have followed um, Ben Sky for a long time. And um, I saw recently there was some criticism of she's an ummer. She, she ums between some things, some uh, answers, and I never noticed it. And um, I think she is phenomenal of thinking. If you look at her skills, she can think on her feet. She answers the questions. She tells, if she doesn't have the answer, she says, I don't have the answer to that, but I'm gonna get you back. Mm. Um, and I just, um, there. and you, you, you can be your own worst critic sometimes. So I think it is important to see where you think your strengths are and where you see improvement and you're not if you wait for perfection you'll never get off the starting line so just starting to do it getting inside there and learning along the way yeah what about um oftentimes in in these um interviews podcasts face slash facebook lives um a lot of times someone will will talk about mentors um or maybe interviewing skills Mm. any any tips there do you, do you mean in terms of like, say on a job, on a job? Interview? Yeah. Or, or yeah. I mean, just whatever you think would be helpful for someone who's just starting their career. Um, you know, is there some, it's, it's, I guess if you're talking about getting a mentor or being in an interview, are there things different in the travel tourism media industry that someone wouldn't know? A little inside baseball. It's kind of a challenge question. I- yeah, I, I think, in, you know, people intrinsically want to help other people. I mean, if you have a local sell and swap in your uh, neck of the woods, you can see if someone puts up, I'm looking for a awesome facialist, you know, typically 30 people will answer that question because I think humans have an intrinsic knowledge to want to help one another. So part of that is reaching out to someone that does, if you're early in your career, you're launching your career. If you're sending an, an email to someone or five people to say, I really um, admire what you do. And one day I'd love to have that position. Do you have any advice for me? I would say nine times out of 10, someone's going to at least reply to your email and give you some nugget of advice or could very easily become a mentor. Because especially when you hit an age, maybe with 15 or 20 years into your career, you want to help the next people and you want to help them maybe not make the mistakes that you did um, and to give them, you know, entree into a world that maybe is, is foreign to them. So outreach, I think, is um, really important uh, for depending on your field. I think creativity is really important. Um, recently, um, AOC had an opening on her staff for some video uh, video. I think there was a producer and there was a creative director and a young, intrepid woman made a, um, a, a video application on why she really, really wants this job and why she's qualified. And she put it on Twitter because AOC is a big Twitter user. I still mm-hmm. love Twitter, I'm a dinosaur. Um, and last time I checked, as of last night, she had 2.2 million views wow. now, which was amazing. And maybe she doesn't get the spot on AOC staff, but I guarantee you out of the $2.2 million, <laughs> someone saw it. And I have to say the comments when I first saw the video kind of, kind of start going viral. Some, everyone was like overwhelmingly like, look at you, go for it. Look at this creative presentation. She was engaging. It was short. It was why I'm qualified. It was grateful. You know, if you'd love for you to take a look at it. So I, I know I'm not in your district, but this is everything as I've been working for. And I can appreciate that. Now, I don't know if that would work in a finance application. <laughs> But it was for a video producer. And this is her saying like, this is my, this is what I can do. And everyone is rooting her on. So I think that's a really good example. I apply, like I said, I always wanted to work exciting places. And I remember there was a record label, um, I think it was in New York. 
Um, probably was. It wasn't West Coast. And I put my resume on a foam quarter guitar, like a two foot guitar with strings. And um, <laughs> I didn't get awesome. the interview. But I was like, what do I have to lose? I mean, you know, there's no part of my existence does not hang in the balance and whether someone's going to open it and you can't control what someone else is going to think. If the right person to open it, they might think this is amazing. Like points for creativity. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And maybe if someone doesn't appreciate creativity would be like, that was just so off base. That's fine. I mean, you're young or that's what you're you know, trying to do. And I, I think that was, I still to this day think about my, my awesome guitar resume. <laughs> Uh, but I, I can't believe also, you to get an interview from that. Yeah, it was it was a it was a really big. I don't know if it was Capitol Records. It was it was something that definitely I wouldn't be surprised if there was, you know, six hundred applicants. <laughs> but I do wonder where the where the famous guitar is today. Um, but your cover it's, letter it's too. A, I mean, it, it's at the Hard Rock that, Cafe. It looked like the Hard Rock Cafe logo. That's exactly what it looked like. Um, but when, when it comes to, to your cover letter, again, it might depend on the field, but if you're sending a resume somewhere, that company knows that you're interested. So you don't have to waste time saying on why you're interested. Tell them why they should hire you. What are you going to bring to the table? And even if, I mean, if it's something that's uh, entry level, you might have experience in, you know, managing something, uh, uh, maybe it was a committee in college. Um, maybe there was something that you volunteered at that was relatable. Um, I remember I was uh, like a co-president, God, I'm really bringing out the, the, the old treasure chest of things, but um, I was a co-president at my college chapter of Amnesty International. And I do always, I've always had um, an affinity for uh, philanthropic organizations and who knows if that's my next path. Um, but I could see, and especially now at LinkedIn, you can see where people's interest lies. You might, there's a probably a good chance you're gonna find a commonality somewhere along the line, whether it's an alma mater, maybe it's a volunteer organization. You know, I think there's a great organization called Girls on the Run and it uh, helps build self-esteem for young, young girls. And, um, you know, if you were to see that that person was a volunteer on their LinkedIn or even was on staff, that might be, you'd be like, oh, I'm really into, you know, causes that, um, you know, advanced uh, opportunities for women. You know, it's, it's a great entry. So the resume should be why they should hire you. I, I think that's so fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's lunchtime at the home office. So I got, ah. <laughs> I had the meet going. <laughs> um, what about, I, I would love to, because we're almost out of time, but I would love to get your take on, obviously, travel and tourism is in a huge COVID hit um, area, but what is, what is your crystal ball look like in terms of where we are, how long it might take to come back, um, and maybe how things might change? I feel confident saying that it's going to be, it's going to rebound. I think it's going to be a progressive ramp up to get back to occupancy levels the way they were. Um, and just like the vaccine rollout, I think it's going to be uh, step by step. But the good news is the step is always gonna be in the right direction. We're getting a little bit closer, we're getting a little bit closer. So by the time Americans might feel very confident in traveling again, um, I think that we're going to see a rebound effect of people wanting to travel more than ever, um, both domestically and internationally. So. Uh, before, maybe it'll be a full year from now before we see a full recovery. But I think there's also going to be an incentive to do more leisure traveling and to do more business travel, to have more in-person conferences, to have more in-person executive retreats. If there's one thing this has taught us is the power of being face-to-face. -face. And um, that is just a big thing to uh, capitalize on relationships and to build relationships. and. Um, you know, the golf course, I call it of, of yesteryear might be gone. Um, not that people don't still golf, but those extracurricular activities where you kind of get to know somebody on a personal level. Um, maybe that's by having dinner with a client or by going to an event that you get some face to face time. So I'm confident that it's going to not only come back, but I think it's going to come back with a vengeance, but it's going to be slow and progressive. It's going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint, mm. but I think there's good news. I mean, um, 
millions and millions and millions of jobs were lost and millions and millions of dollars in revenue um, were lost. And th so that's going to just have a very intrinsic recovery period, like any industry. At the same time, we've seen other industries rise and thrive during this time. So uh, all of those things are going to, in my opinion, layer to a successful rebound. Just be patient. Yeah, and I think too, if you think about um, people still want experiences, how they are forging those experiences may be changing. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if we were talking about this, um, about the impact on businesses in Newport. And granted, I wasn't downtown very much, but it looked like things were still busy. And I would see a lot of sort of complaints about like, why are people out without masks and things like that? And it tended to be out of towners. Also, we mm -hmm. live next to an Airbnb house and okay. it was Mykonos every weekend. <laughs> so I, you know, I think that there, there, things are still happening. They're just happening differently and maybe scaled back. So it makes me wonder, you know, when things do come back, how are they going to be different? That's going to be interesting to observe. I personally think that there will be a greater interest in Airbnbs because I think that gives you the opportunity uh, to travel with multi-generational or many groups. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to an uh, Airbnb. It's, it's an Airbnb uh, owner that has five properties that are nearby and all the properties have three, four, five bedrooms. Um, and that's something I would be interested in. You know, a good yep. friend. I have, I have a small child, um, you know, families that we're friends with, like, and it doesn't necessarily have to be anything um, beyond a, a driving vacation, but just to take a weekend, like we went over to Nantucket last Christmas, um, but that kind of travel was, and I use that as an example only because I think those, uh, that pattern of leisure travel is going to perhaps be a big rebound by traveling with bigger groups. So instead of your nuclear family, it might be also this time bringing grandma and grandpa, bringing your in-laws, bringing your sister-in-law and um, mm -hmm. using Airbnb mm -hmm. because that's really, you know, the best setting for that. So I do think those could be a huge, um, that could impact them in a very good way. I've talked to Airbnb owners in Newport that have um, really had the greatest summer of their of, of, of their business um, because people that might've traditionally gone to a hotel where there's more interaction with people and there's the concierge and there's the valet. Um, it's just more of a linear experience if you go to a house. So um, right. I, I'm, I'm pulling for them, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to be a good thing in that sector. Yeah. Yeah. I just think about all these small businesses and storefronts and, you know, they're, they're obviously getting a big hit, but um, hopefully, hopefully, we figured out what the recipe is, right? The recipe for staying safe and everybody follows the recipe and um, we get, you know, granted it's the new normal, but and it's not exactly what we want, but you get right. a little something. There's going to be a, yeah. And there's going to be a middle space, I think, between what risk mitigation looks to you. So so some people might come and travel to an Airbnb, but they may not feel comfortable doing indoor dining, or they may not even feel comfortable doing outdoor dining, but they may do takeout to a restaurant. Um, I was still talking to a restaurant owner yesterday um, that didn't even have a takeout program because he said, you know, our restaurant is set up to be an experience. Our restaurant is set up so that the diner can see inside the open kitchen and so that they can see our beautiful like chalkboard with all the specials on it. Um, it's, we are not meant to be takeout, right. but you know, like everybody had to pivot, had to think quickly. It's less than ideal. It's keeping their head above water. It's, you know, mm -hmm. barely, you know, if making a profit, it's barely, um, I don't think the regular consumer knows about the costs involved with takeout. I mean, packaging, packaging is expensive. If you have a third party delivery service that takes out a huge chunk of your profit margin, um, you know, I talked to a chef that said like, my sauces aren't meant for boxes and, <laughs> and he wasn't even meaning in it. Hashtag. Uh, pretend yeah. <laughs> Hashtag sauce problems. Um, <laughs> but it's meant to drizzle over the steak. And, um, you know, there's a part of, he's like, I took a whole semester in plating. <laughs> I <missed> oh. plating. <laughs> and I could, I could understand that. I said, Oh, that's, that's tough. Um, 
So all those considerations, uh, hopefully will, and I, I do think there's going to be things that we take with us, um, both in the industry and as travelers. You know, I think people have adopted more sanitary practices. You know, maybe you're not always thinking twice now before you're, you know, running down the stairs and your hands just on that banister the whole way down, you know, Penn <laughs> Station. <laughs> I can't think about that right now. Yes, uh, I know. And, and being more patient, you know, hopefully as we come out of this, also the appreciation level. Now, I don't think that's going to last forever, but I mm. do think when people are traveling again, there might be a uh, gratefulness and appreciation level that hopefully they take with them. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> or better, better manny, manners when standing in line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrea, yeah. for sharing your insights. And, um, I think it's really important. Some of the things that we talked about today that are about travel and media and starting your career in general and how getting out there and getting experience and building portfolio pieces is a huge part of ROI and you. And, um, you know, we try to make it very turnkey so that you have that portfolio, you have the experiences you can talk about when you go into that interview. It just makes life so much easier. And uh, yeah, so really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I, you know, I think it's important for people starting out to have thick skin and not be too hard on themselves and just look at everything as an opportunity. And, you know, maybe it'll lead to something, maybe it won't, maybe you'll build a friendship um, or, or a business relationship. Um, but, um, you know, no matter what, you just got to work your butt off once it comes down to. That's a great, that's a great final tip. Okay. Well, we will stop our stream and stop the.